and um, thank you guys for coming uh, to this last talk. I try. I will try to uh, do it short, so you can uh, go home and relax after a hard w uh, day. And uh, thanks, uh, organizers, for inviting me. Uh, it's a uh, big pleasure to me to come to this awesome city and this uh, uh, beautiful conference. Uh, so today we're going uh, to talk about uh, fast data architecture, lessons learned, and uh, thoughts uh, about the future. Um, so my name is uh, Roman Ivanov. I'm a, a solutions architect at Excite, and also I'm a co-organizer of Reactive Amsterdam Meetup Group. I'm uh, really passionate about uh, Scala, data, and everything what is related to building reactive systems. So let's see what's uh, coming today. And we are, we're going to talk about Excite as a company. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, and see some videos about the product. Uh, also, we will discuss the backend architecture and uh, the, how we build the data layer and which concepts we are uh, pursuing to implement in the future. Also, um, I will introduce the idea of reactive data. And hopefully, we will still have some time for the demo. So let's start. Uh, what is Excite? Excite is a music television company. Uh, it has a headquarter in Amsterdam and uh, uh, spread globally in Europe, uh, United States, Canada, Qatar, and growing more. In total, we are reaching uh, 15 uh, million uh, households, and this number will be growing uh, soon. So uh, now um, I want to introduce you the product of Excite that we are building, which is interactive music television, personalized music television. And the best would be to show you the video about this product. We are Excite. For over seven years, we have provided music videos to more than 15 million homes and devices through our several Excite networks and full catalog of on-demand services because we love music videos. Some time ago, Excite revolutionized the way people consume music videos because if you have access to all music videos, where do you start and what do you play? The goal was simple, dramatically increase viewing time by improving the user experience with minimal input from the user. In other words, build a personalized music video channel without users having to select the music videos themselves. We started studying consumer behavior on all the different screens, TV, tablet, mobile, and PC. Rebuilt Excite's heavily curated music videos catalog, combined that with our territory-specific music programming intelligence, and built an algorithm that produces dynamic playlists based on very basic user input skipping and liking music videos. And this is what we came up with. From the moment you start Excite, you are prompted to like or skip what you see. Every time you do this, Excite learns about what you like and what you don't like. Excite combines the constant flow of user data with its music programming technology and compiles a continuously learning personalized channel. So now you are watching Excite with only music videos you love in your perfect order. For even deeper personalization, we built the Hear, See, Feel system, where you tell us which genres you want to hear, what type of videos you want to see, and how you feel. Then simply push play and your personalized dynamic channel starts. We are proud to say that we reinvented the way we view music videos on any device wherever we are. Excite. We love music videos. Yep. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, we're definitely not a boring company. Uh, uh, entertainment is in our DNA. Uh, so uh, next, I would like to speak about the backend and uh, how we build it. Our core technology is Scala and uh, we're using Akka. Uh, we host uh, everything in uh, Google Cloud and orchestrate by Kubernetes. Uh, our major data source is uh, uh, MongoDB. We store user profiles and channel configurations, and uh, that's how that's how actually uh, the full picture of the backend system looks like. So um, here you can see. Um, 
viewers. Uh, they watch television with their set -up box. And uh, um, this set -up box uh, has an application which interacts with the um, uh, service called Player. And this service uh, gives a recommendation about the next music video and uh, provides the uh, list of channels uh, and um, different filters that you can uh, build your own channel from it. So then uh, it comes to MongoDB to read the, the configuration which is provided by our music team. And this music team uses front-end, admin front-end, and then it goes to REST API back-end, and then it, it goes like this to synchronize the channel's configurations. And um, initially we had only this setup, and uh, then we decided that we need to provide some business intelligence for our um, uh, marketing and business people. And we decided to build some statistics uh, microservice. Uh, with does uh, aggregation to MongoDB and then we just show it on the admin front end it will be the easiest way to solve uh, some basic uh, business intelligence problems and we uh, deployed it it uh, worked for a while uh, but then uh, let's uh, speak about Mongo performance in this context and uh, our typical aggregation uh, query uh, was running uh, on 50 million uh, of records and uh, it's approximately 6 gigs of data and we used the 16 uh, uh, CPU machines uh, for running Mongo and the aggregation time was approximately one and a half uh, um, minute which is fine but uh, the thing is that um, we had 45 um, queries like that and uh, uh, these queries we were running on the same uh, database instance that uh, real-time application was using it for um, clients interaction and uh, in general we, uh, MongoDB is pretty slow in writing because it has a very serious indexing mechanism Mm, and uh, also for uh, aggregation queries we found that uh, joins are pretty complicated task to do. So basically Mongo aggregation for framework uh, we consider a very nice tool but it's not um, ideal for big data actually when you start to increase the amount of data in your system and uh, this solution stops to work. So we uh, decided to completely rethink uh, our situation and uh, um, place some new requirements uh, for our data platform. And we realized first that we already dealing with big data and uh, we have business people who want uh, to get some typical numbers like how many people are watching uh, television now and uh, how, what, which channel is most popular at the moment, etc., etc., and how we're dealing in uh, different countries. So yeah, we, we definitely need business intelligence. Of course, we want uh, to recommend the best content to our viewers, and we want to use machine learning for that. And uh, as soon as we're starting from scratch, we definitely uh, want best practices to build data pl platform. And as Scala developers, Akka developers, we think reactive. So we uh, kept this idea in mind that we want to build this uh, with these principles already included. Okay, so luckily our company provides us uh, uh, with a, a training um, uh, uh, budget and we went to a conf conference in uh, Gdansk, Scala Wave, a very nice conference and uh, Actually, we met uh, Roland Kuhn and uh, Konrad Malawski. We just bumped them on the party and started to ask them questions. How would they solve for our problem with that layer? And they, both of them, gave uh, approximately the same answer. And we were so surprised when we came back and uh, we decided that this is, uh, this is it. We, we have the answer. And in about three uh, months, uh, Lightband published uh, mm, uh, first uh, paper about uh, fast data platform and here how it looks so it has the uh, it has two um, uh, data streams uh, uh, two types of data streams the first is reactive you, you know reactive uh, streams and others um, are different it could be anything HTTP FTP uh, you name it and um, let's look first on the reactive streams. Uh, you have uh, some reactive uh, system upstream, which produces events uh, to your ACA stream. And then ACA stream uh, then publishes it to uh, Spark streaming um, 
or it uh, publishes it to Kafka. And uh, then, then it's decided what was the flow next. Uh, or you have different other services and then you have Kafka Connect, which is beautiful. And you can integrate basically Kafka with any, anything and produce events in your system with the help of, uh, with, uh, help of Kafka. And from there you also uh, have it in uh, Spark Streaming or um, uh, any other uh, flashing uh, design of your choice. So this is the basic concept of fast data. Um, now let's speak about the benefits. Um, first um, uh, is ingest. Ingest is not a typical ingest that you you take like a CSV file or some some other source and then you just chunk it and then you uh, create uh, uh, structured data. Ingest is always an event in this architecture. And no matter where it comes, it is an event. So um, then. Um, it's, uh, this architecture supports a uh, multi-paradigm transform uh, mechanism. Um, it means that uh, you can transform your uh, data with a streaming approach or you can uh, do it uh, afterwards uh, with a bash approach. Um, also, it uh, supports uh, multiple technologies of load, which means that after your data is transformed, you can either uh, put it back to the stream or you can actually flush it to some uh, cold, cold uh, storage like HDFS, Cassandra, something like that. So, meaning that you're switching to, to batch. Um, yeah. It is very helpful um, uh, for online machine learning because you can update your uh, model faster. It has a very low footprint. You can run microservice, which just reads the stream, keeps the model, updates it on the, on the fly, and then does prediction also uh, to another stream of your um, uh, requests. A typical example is uh, uh, Kamins algorithm. Kamins is used for um, segmentation of, uh, um, in our case, of segmentations of users, and you create two streams, for example, one stream and another stream. You can train it on one stream, and then you can predict uh, on the other stream. That's it, so easy. It's, it could be run as a microservice, standalone, and it will do machine learning online. Uh, we chose to, to uh, use Kafka because, um, first of all, it's a recommendation. Um, second, is uh, very reliable, scalable, and um, it is integrated with most of the uh, um, well-known and uh, widely used technologies. And it takes some time to understand the concept, uh, to wrap your mind around it, but eventually uh, the system uh, shows as a very good solution for most of the cases uh, in streaming uh, system design. Also, we're using ACA streams uh, um, in, con in con context of uh, microservices uh, because it is uh, reactive and, in general, it is uh, very well designed uh, from all the uh, aspects, actors, uh, um, streams. We love it. Of course, uh, we wanted to have uh, something that is a multi-tool because uh, we want to build a platform uh, which potentially can be used by e data scientists, by machine learning engineers, by software developers, and it should be uh, uh, universal. So we decided to go for Spark uh, because also it's, it supports batch and streaming approach and has already very serious infrastructure uh, for big data processing. And uh, we can we can do Scala, we can do Python and R, and yeah, everybody will be happy about that. Uh, also, we chosen uh, Cassandra. Um, it, from our experience, it's very fast. Uh, we managed uh, to um, ingest uh, 20k uh, records per second. And um, it's scalable by design. Um, and if you're talking about uh, data science, uh, in, in our opinion, uh, Cassandra uh, is uh, very uh, useful because it's a uh, white column, um, data frames uh, friendly uh, storage design, and uh, it's open source. So for us, uh, open source is one of the key benefits. We want to really get control on how we deploy um, uh, the infrastructure, and um, yeah, in, in the worst possible case, we want to go to the code and you know contribute to it. Also, we decided uh, to use uh, ELK as uh, our um, solution uh, for um, business intelligence. Um, well, um, 
this uh, decision was made uh, at the very beginning uh, because we wanted to substitute the statistic module that we had and uh, we wanted to start aggregating some uh, basic numbers and understand how our, our uh, system is, is going. And uh, it allows uh, to uh, aggregate logs, it allows to aggregate some um, um, specific uh, data streams and um, it has a wide um, range of features to um, um, represent it in a beautiful uh, uh, graphical way. Um, uh, comparatively, it was uh, easy to set up, so we were uh, pretty uh, happy about how um, our EOK integration uh, went. So now we're still using it and our business people love it. Uh, maybe we will have some time uh, for the demo. Uh, another important aspect was to introduce uh, data protocols. Um, well, uh, what we say about data protocols are um, the formats of uh, transferring uh, data um, over the streaming systems. Uh, it is important because if you have different microservices producing data and different data sources, so somewhere you read from FTP, somewhere you read uh, from internet or whatever, uh, you don't want to get lost in the formats of the data sources. You want to standardize. This is how our uh, logs look like. This is uh, how our metrics look like. And uh, this is how uh, some um, valuable data should look like. So we kind of uh, created um, uh, all of the company standards uh, that is understandable by everyone. And uh, if we have um, a data analyst, uh, it will be easier for him to build the same dashboards for any other team or any other purpose uh, based on the uh, standardized uh, data. So as a result, uh, we uh, have this uh, architecture. On the top you can see uh, the application layer. Here we have TV, mobile, uh, web application. They are talking uh, HTTP to Apollo um, Player API. This is um, uh, the, our B2C layer. Uh, Apollo API uh, reads uh, configuration from MongoDB still using admin API. Um, and, uh, we have the configuration um, stored. And then all the events, uh, likes, skip, challenge, change, everything, uh, what is happening on the front end, even um, the behavior, let's say, after um, going to this channel, a person decided to go to search, these events also uh, propagated and uh, this uh, Apollo Player API um, uh, pushes it to Kafka. And from Kafka, everything is distributed in different uh, ways. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, um, Kafka uh, ELK integration for business intelligence where we read some uh, basic information immediately. Actually, it's very close to real time. Um, the monitoring of uh, some uh, live environments is very easy uh, with this uh, uh, connection. Also, uh, some critical data that we'll, we want to save forever. Uh, we sent uh, to Cassandra Data Lake. Uh, by the way, uh, Cassandra is chosen as our primary data lake. Mm, and then uh, we can uh, have uh, Apache's uh, Spark uh, microservices uh, for uh, streaming, stream processing uh, with Kafka or um, the same um, Spark deployment can read data from Cassandra and process it in a batch uh, mode. Then also uh, we are doing some uh, data science and uh, analytics and statistics aggregations on, on, on these platforms. For that we're using uh, Zeppelin and Jupyter notebooks which are connected to Spark and Cassandra. And eventually uh, you can see recommender systems um, a set of microservices. They read data from Cassandra 
or they read data from uh, Kafka, depending on the type of the algorithm. And eventually these recommender systems, um, they send data back to Apollo player as a recommendation for the content choice or uh, something else. So basically to improve the uh, feed uh, to the user and then it propagates back to the user. So that was uh, our uh, final design. Uh, we're very happy about that. Actually, it uh, looks uh, mm, uh, pretty uh, promising to us in the near future. We don't expect to have uh, any serious change in, uh, yeah, because it's, it's scalable, it's uh, uh, modern, um, yeah, it satisfies all our needs so far. But um, it's never enough, of course, and if you're a reactive-oriented uh, developer, and um, in my case, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer that uh, nothing is better than, than this concept. The reactive manifesto is something that you should keep in mind every time you're creating any type of system and try to stick with these uh, uh, principles. So how about uh, thinking uh, uh, about data layers in these terms? And I named it uh, this concept as reactive data. So, uh, to uh, describe you uh, the concept, uh, let's start with some basic uh, idea what is, uh, what is sharding. Let's recap. Sharding is when you have a collection of data and you just, um, um, you just um, distribute it all over different nodes, as many as you have. And uh, depending on the, some sharding strategy here, you put it in uh, one of the uh, buckets. Okay, so this is... Um, sharding and uh, uh, let's take a look at this picture now. So uh, here you have Aka streams, um, they produce the feed and uh, imagine that uh, they, uh, they connect to Kafka and uh, as soon as we have control on um, the uh, partition uh, strategy, mm, mm, uh, we, we, we have a control on partition strategy on the producer side. We can decide which uh, uh, way we want to um, uh, produce data to Kafka. And then as soon as data is produced to Kafka, uh, you have, this is, this is one topic, one topic, it, it has two uh, partitions. And after that, um, uh, from Kafka, you can, uh, with the help of a connector, you can ingest data to Cassandra, for example, and uh, store it as the main uh, shard uh, of your uh, partition here. And uh, the same shard will be used on the Spark side um, uh, to read uh, the local um, uh, data from uh, Cassandra. And all these guys, share the same principle of uh, data partitioning. And why is this is so? Because you actually, if you control this full uh, stack, you can say, I want to decide my partition strategy like that, and it will be propagated all over the, uh, the systems. And eventually on Spark side, you will have the lowest latency possible, no shuffles, and you will read the data as fast as possible. So this would be like, a uh, fast data lane here. This will be a fast data lanes. And uh, uh, this will run in one pod, all the instances, um, and uh, controlled by Kubernetes. This is our idea. Uh, you can define a pod which runs uh, uh, three instances of these um, uh, systems and will be treated as one uh, deployment unit. Well, with that, um, uh, we think that depending on the pressure on, on Kafka, we can build some custom metrics in Kubernetes and decide where we can uh, uh, scale um, the system or where we can uh, shrink it down. And also, uh, we uh, think that um, the processing of data will be as fast as possible. So the responsiveness of uh, um, this design is close to the maximum uh, possible. Okay, so and now I think, yeah, we have uh, plenty of time left. Uh, let's uh, do a little uh, demo. Uh, I will show you what is Helm. Uh, and uh, uh, who guys know what is Helm? Um, 
Okay, so Helm is the um, is the system which operates on top of Kubernetes and allows you to manage uh, systems deployments. And uh, uh, we will deploy a Spark um, cluster and use uh, uh, Zeppelin um, to see how uh, Spark and uh, Cassandra integrates together. All right, so I'm connecting to VPN. Yes, um, um, Helm actually operates, uh, does, does it uh, uh, look okay? Uh, do you see well, guys? Okay, nice. So um, Helm um, operates on charts. Charts uh, is the description of your service. And um, yeah, you can, you can see it. Um, that you have a chart YAML. We can take a look how, how, how it is defined. So basically, uh, mm, it's very simple. Some yeah, sources uh, and uh, maintainers. So the, here is nothing interesting. More interesting is um, mm, values. Values are where you define uh, what is your image you're going to deploy. Um, then you actually define all the ports. Uh, here you define the, the service that you're going to deploy in Kubernetes. We're also going to deploy Zeppelin. Yeah, and uh, that will be everything you need to deploy. All right. So um, I'm having a command here. First, uh, um, um, I will check if Minikube is running. Uh, Anything? Yeah, it's probably like this. Minikube is the uh, environment for running Kubernetes locally. Well, basically, besides uh, Kubernetes systems, uh, there is nothing else running there. So uh, we will start to deploy um, uh, a service. Uh, we name it um, uh, Spark Kubernetes, and we provide the values that we have shown. And we say that uh, we take chart from the local directory. So we hit it and we see that, yeah, it printed us the status deployed. Uh, we can see that in Kubernetes, we have uh, three services, uh, Master Web UI and uh, Zeppelin. Also, we have several deployments. We have uh, three workers. We have three workers uh, for Spark. Yeah, and um, the next step would be to try and submit some job to um, um, to Spark. Uh, for that, uh, we'll use Minikube again. Um, yes, now we can see that we have Spark Master running. We take uh, exposed uh, uh, hostname and port. IPM port, and then we go to um, local instance of Spark where I have prepared the job to submit to it. So I go to Spark and I have um, a job called uh, submit uh, pi to predator machine. Uh, typical um, submit uh, looks like that. You have uh, Spark uh, submit and then you provide the class um, uh, SparkPy is the toy, pro toy uh, example uh, for any sp uh, Spark uh, deployments. If you want to check uh, connectivity, it's like a hello world. Basically, uh, now uh, we need to provide the address of uh, um, a master. So master is uh, the node which receives the job request uh, for Spark. And um, we change this part of the URL and uh, paste uh, uh, what we just copied from um, Minikube output. So we save it and uh, fingers crossed we are running it. We start it. So 
something is running. Task schedule, add in task. Yep. Yeah. So everything is stopped and I can see the output here and you will see it's also that pi is roughly equivalent to this number. If you guys agree, disagree, you can uh, do it better. <laughs> but this is the test example. Okay, so what just happened is that uh, we deployed from scratch uh, uh, Spark service, which has three workers, one master node, uh, one Zeppelin, and we just submitted a job from the external, external system to it, and it worked. So, so fast, so cool. Um, Spark in about three minutes or so. I, I, I would say it's, it's incredible. All right, then um, let's move to the other part of the uh, demo. Sorry guys, I have a little bit of um, mess after reboot and I will show that we also, ah yes, it's here. So we also working on our own uh, Cassandra uh, Helm chart uh, at Excite. Uh, probably we're gonna make it uh, public soon. And uh, yeah, eventually we want to uh, build this um, reactive data system uh, fully working uh, on Kubernetes and preferably with the help of Helm. Um, then I want to show you an example of um, Zeppelin uh, integration with um, um, Cassandra and Spark. So uh, a typical notebook looks like that. Uh, Cassandra connector, um, we import a couple of um, packages then um, who knows what is RDD, we can use uh, Cassandra RDD to uh, query um, Spark RDD uh, uh, to query some of the Cassandra uh, data. Bam, now it's working. Um, then uh, in Zeppelin it is allowed to switch the interpreters on the same notebook you can immediately uh, set that now I want to use uh, Cassandra uh, CQL and write, uh, I think you, you don't see it well. Yeah. So, and write uh, only Cassandra uh, query language um, queries and also execute them. Yeah, you can see that the output is provided. I limited uh, response to five. So it looks like that. And uh, now you can do Cassandra data frames uh, uh, also. And let's ask to print the schema of the uh, collection. Well, it also shows us the schema. And uh, then we can do some basic operations on data frames, Spark data frames. You hit it, you take also five um, records which has uh, is favorite true. Cool, everything also also working, but the the most inter interesting part for me is the integration of uh, Zeppelin with uh, uh, SQL interpreter and uh, Spark uh, together. So look what's going on here. You have uh, um, Spark temporary view, which you name actions, and you say that this is table um, action history and key space users. And you say Spark SQL, please register this temporary view for me. You ask for this, bam, it's finished. And then I go back to SQL interpreter. Here you can see it's a SQL interpreter where I, p I write pure um, SQL and it will run against the Spark registered uh, temporary view. Bam, and you see the output. Basically, what it means is that you can uh, you can define all all your systems. You, you can define all your Spark processing pipelines, uh, set some uh, um, usable um, uh, views, invite uh, anybody from your company who knows SQL, and say, "Well, now you're able to query uh, the system." And it will trigger all the big data processing. Uh, it will trigger. 
um, all the computations uh, in the cluster and the person doesn't have to know anything about uh, the infrastructure underneath. So we find it uh, pretty cool. Uh, our journey is somewhere uh, um, somewhere at 50% uh, uh, completion and uh, yeah there are plenty of things uh, to do to learn and um, uh, we invite you to join us in this uh, uh, trip we're hiring Scala uh, Java uh, UNUX developers if you're interested uh, please uh, contact us at hrdx.com and um, thanks a lot again guys for uh, coming on this talk so late i hope you had some fun <laughs>